Hi, I'm Pastor Joe. I'd like to invite you on Palm Sunday, March the 25th, and then on Easter Sunday, April the 1st, to a two-part musical drama entitled, The Tomb is Empty Now, performed by our Parkway Choir and Drama Team. Don't miss this special performance. I don't have to ask y'all if you know where Atlanta, Georgia is. <laughs> Most of you been through it. How many you ever eaten at the Varsity Restaurant? Anybody ever eaten at the Varsity Restaurant? I think we got a picture of it right here. It's varsity Restaurant, right downtown the heart of Atlanta. You can pass by it. Started in 1928 by Frank Gordy at 55 North Avenue. On the very first day that he started the Varsity Restaurant, he had 300 people show up to eat. I'd say that's a pretty successful launch as they were moving between trolley cars in 1928. 1939, Clark Gable shows up, if you don't know the history. Eats at the Varsity Has Gone with the Wind is premiered in Atlanta. 1948, Nipsey Russell, famous comedian, worked four years as a car hop at this restaurant and says that's what launched him into his great comedy career. Frank Gordy put two televisions in rooms for you to eat and watch TV, which is a bad idea, but we do it all the time. In 1948, he was ahead of his time. It seats 650 people. And when you go in there to, to the Varsity Restaurant, visited by President Clinton, President George H.W. Bush, President Obama, it's an iconic place, as you know. When you go in there, there's a bank of cash registers. It's not like a department store where there's 100 cash registers and only one that's open, and it's barely open. Everybody's man in these cash registers, and it's a, a mass of humanity. And behind every cash register is a person who says, and you know what they say, what do you have, 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 what do you have? <laughs> if you've just moved here from the north, the translation on that is, what would you like to eat in your mouth today? That's what that means. This morning I have a message called, what, what do you have? There were two men in Matthew 20 had to answer that very question. It was a profound question, a profound answer. But before we get to the Matthew 20, I just want to look at one verse from Luke chapter 11. Luke chapter 11, verse 10. For everyone who asks receives, and he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks the door will be open. If we really, really, really believe that as the Western church, I believe there would be a whole lot more asking and seeking and knocking. That your Tuesday night men's prayer meeting would be bursting at the seams if we really, really, really deep down believe those words. But we don't sometimes because why? We don't really believe it. We treat, we treat it differently. Because maybe somebody has asked and not received. Somebody has sought and not found what they thought they should find. Someone has knocked and there has been no open door, so they treat it like spam. You know what I mean? A spam email. You get those emails? Hello, my name is Mutanda from Angola. You have won a million dollars inheritance. Wow. I told you our ship would come in, baby. All we need is $2,000 to wire the money to your account by 5 o'clock Thursday. <laughs> Delete. Spam. Except there, somebody, somebody will say occasionally, well, let's give them the, let's give them a social security number and your mother's maiden name. We'll see what it hurts. <laughs> Can't win if you don't play. <laughs> and so we yawn through verses like this and we hit the delete button when we don't really believe it. This story is about two men who didn't hit the delete button. And they believed, ask, seek, knock to their core. Matthew chapter 20 We'll pick up uh, verse 29. As Jesus and his disciples were leaving Jericho, a large crowd followed him, and two blind men were sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was going by, they shouted, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us! And the crowd rebuked them and told them to be quiet. They shouted all the louder, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us! And Jesus stopped and called to them. 
What do you want me to do for you? He asked. Lord, we want our sight. Jesus had compassion on them and touched their eyes. And immediately they received their sight and followed him. I felt the Holy Spirit impress upon me to ask this question. What do you have? I've been told that blind people, blind people have a greater and heightened sensitivity in the other four senses, the smell and the hearing, the touch and, and taste, that, that, that those kind of escalate when, they're, when people are blind. On an airplane, I read a book called uh, The Seven Keys, and there was a story about Eric Weinheimer, and he was born with sight, but at 13, he got a congenital disease, and so he lost his sight and was blind. And the book said that, that he was very bitter at first until he discovered rock climbing, mountain climbing, and the tactile nature of, of the cliff and the touch and the wind blowing off the, of the side of the mountain just made, a, just made him alive, and he loved it. He's the first guy that ever climbed Mount Everest blind, first blind climber. 29,000 feet, 100 mile an hour winds, minus 30 degrees, and 10% of people who try die, which is not a great statistic. That'd be like saying, you three rows up, see in heaven. You know, that's not a good statistic. There are two blind men you know, sitting by the side of the road, and their senses are heightened. One of them hears it. a commotion. There's a sense of the commotion. Did you hear What's going on? Je Jesus, did you hear Je Je Prophet, I heard him. I saw somebody say the prophet. The teacher, the teacher. The, somebody's calling him a master. You think that's Jesus? Healer, did you hear that? The healer is passing by, and right as the commotion gets in front of these blind men, one of them jumps up and says, Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Shut your mouth. That's Jesus. You be quiet. I'm sorry, you're right. That was dumb. I should be seen and not heard. I wish I could see, though, but I understand. No, they didn't have that attitude. They didn't have that attitude. They might have said, okay, I, I got you, but maybe this. Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Jesus stops the entourage. The train stops right in front of these men, and he says, what do you have, 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 what do you have? What do you want me to do for you? In the woods last year, I really felt impressed by the Holy Spirit. I felt like he said to me, ask my people what they want. Ask my people what they want. So that's what I'm doing today out of obedience. Years ago, I spoke in another state. It was back of Lord Sunday, graduation Sunday. The youth pastor went to the podium and he recognized 20 graduates. Not, maybe not even 20. It took 20 minutes to, to recognize eight graduates. Not because he was grandstanding, but because he had such a severe speech impediment. It just took him a long, 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 long time. To do it, and I remember thinking how courageous it was of him and how courageous of the pastor to hire a young man like that. And at lunch afterwards, the pastor was sitting here, the pastor's wife and the staff minister was to my left, single young man. And he asked me at lunch if I had remembered praying for somebody who was sick. And I said, son, I pray for a lot of sick people. You're going to have to give me some more detail. And he began to talk to me about somebody that I had prayed for. And I said, wait a minute, this is kind of coming back. He was a short, squatty kid, had a yellow shirt, had a severe speech impediment, and went to a microphone and said seven things in the microphone that he was never a, uh, able to say in his life. And he said, yeah, that, 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 that was me, 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 me. And now I'm very intrigued because it's obvious that he has a speech impediment. And I say, can we talk tomorrow? At breakfast, and I'll give you a little napkin talk on youth ministry. I still got those youth pastor juices in me. So we met at a little diner on the, on the highway, and he began to tell me how God had used this speech impediment in his youth ministry to reach people. And this just question hit me. Questions are important. And I called him by name, and I said, what if everything in this little cafe froze right now? The guy pouring... Uh, the lady pouring the coffee just freezes right in midstream. I freeze right here at the table. 
And the guy over here, he's pouring sugar packets. That all freezes. A lady with the plates on her hands. That Everything freezes except for you. And Jesus of Nazareth walks through the wall. And he walks right up to this table. And his robe brushes against it. And he looks at you with piercing eyes and says your name more beautifully than you've ever heard your name pronounced and said. Whatever you want, I'll do. I will take this speech impediment off of you forevermore. Or I'll continue to glorify my name in the middle of that weakness, but it's up to you. I said, now, son, this is very personal. You don't have to answer. And it's amoral. It's not an immoral question. It's an amoral question. There's no morality. I don't have the answer. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm very curious. What would you say? And uh, it was quiet for an awkwardly long time. And he got very emotional. His eyes filled with tears. And he looked at me and gave me an honest answer. He said, I don't know what I would say. So now I got a question for you. What if everybody froze right now in this room? The preacher froze in place. Grandma's looking for a mint. She freezes in place. There's a guy checking an ESPN score. He freezes in place. Wife's giving him the skunk eye. She freezes in place. And Jesus walks in and his robe touches and brushes against your pew, looks at you because you're the only one unfrozen, piercing eyes of beauty and calls your name in the most spectacular way you've ever heard your name pronounced and said, what do you want me to do for you? Do you, do you know what you'd tell the Lord? Do you have any idea what you'd say to the Lord? As you think about your answer, let me give you four little nuggets to chew on. Four little nuggets to chew on. Number one, you need to know what you want. You need to know what you want. Do you know what happens to a generation of people who do not know what they want? They eat Tide Pods and put it on the Internet. <laughs> not all of them. Not these guys. The knuckleheads. Generation doesn't know what they want. They, they, they bring five of their buddies on an overpass in Michigan and throw rocks at passing vehicles on the interstate because they have no compelling reason to get out of bed in the morning. Not just young people, but old people too. You need to know what you want. I tell my kids, God gives us the desires of our hearts. I'm not God, so I can't put that desire in your heart, I'm just coaching you to have a desire, whatever you want. We've been in youth ministry for 15 or 20 years. We don't have a lot of money. We've got four of you brats, but I'm telling you, we'll try to make it happen. <laughs> Soccer, ballet, dance. You want to play basketball, baseball? You want to be a horse jockey? Well, you're six foot four and 240 pounds, Well, we'll see if we can work it out. Why do you just need to want something? <laughs> just want something. Know what you want. We had, a, we had a white Honda Odyssey minivan for many, many years, maybe 12 years. And uh, all four kids took uh, their dates to the prom in that minivan. It was a rite of passage. <clears throat> and we'd, pull up to a, we'd pull up driving through Georgia at a, at a drive through restaurant. If hell had a way to get food, it'd be at a drive through restaurant, I'm convinced. It's just I hate those places. <laughs> Hush, family, let's wait on the interpretation. <laughs> we pull up to that drive through squawk box, and I tell my kids, you know, you know Daddy loves you? I love all of you. And I got your order memorized. But I'm telling you, if one of you says, hey, Dad, tell make sure that I won't get uh, mustard on that, and man, I need some pickles, I promise you, you're going to starve. You're going to starve to the next drive through because I'm not going to get you food in your mouth. I'm not. I want you to know what you want. In uh, 10 days, I'll be going, the Lord willing, to Budapest, hungry to, to uh, conduct a conference on the Holy Spirit and speak at an international Christian school in Budapest, spiritual emphasis during the day. Did that last year on the way back through Munich, I don't know if it was Martin Luther that inspired me. He had 95 theses, but I wrote down, sent it to a printer. Nobody's ever read it except me. 
The printer's not even allowed to read it, but I wrote down, if the Lord lets me live for 20 more years, I call it the 5373 plan, 7300 days. This is what I would like to see in my life spiritually, 94 things, spiritually, intellectually, family or family-wise, legacy, financially, professionally, all of these things, 94 things. So if Jesus said, Joe, what would you like me to do for you? I said, well, start with this. Let's just start with that right there. That'll be the first phase right there. Know what you want. These boys knew what they wanted. Number two, be sure that you should want it. Be sure that you should want to put up that Mark scripture, that first Mark scripture that we skipped just a moment ago. What do you want me to do for you? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Jesus asked him, and the blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, your faith has healed you. That's the guy who knew what he wanted. Now let's put this Mark 10 scripture, verse 36, I think. What do you want me to do for you? He asked. They replied, let one of us sit at your right hand and the other at your left in your glory. You don't know what you're asking, Jesus said. Yeah. See, we think sometimes that Jesus is a genie in a bottle. We just, you know, we get everything. Sometimes he says no, like right there. It was no the first time and no the one millionth time. It's a no. Somebody said, uh, I'll follow you, Jesus, but I got to go bury my dad. Let the dead bury the dead. Follow me. Go, Jesus, unless it's your daddy. You know, there, there are times when there is a no. Be sure that you should want it. How many of you with an upraised hand, not a rhetorical question, how many of you with an upraised hand can honestly say that you are grateful to God for some prayer in your life that he said no to? Raise your hand. Look at that. Look at that. That's grace and mercy. Look at that. <laughs> Be sure that you should want it. Now, I could come to this, I could come to this altar and I could pray a prayer like this. Dear God, I have a prayer for you. You said, uh, if we could ask anything in your name, it shall be done. And I'm, gonna, I'm not leaving here till you grant this. They're going to have to bring me food and a pillow. I'll stay here a week. I'm not moving. Sheet and a bedpan, whatever they need. I, I'm not leaving this spot. I'm asking of you, oh God, to let me be the starting point guard for the Golden State Warriors. I want to take Steph Curry's place. And I don't want it to be a one-game gimmick for attendance. I want to be the starting point guard for years. And I want to dunk. Lord, right now all I can dunk is a donut. Please, God. <laughs> now, now, i got a question for you. Doesn't the Bible say we can do all things through Jesus Christ who strengthens us? And doesn't the Bible say with man things are impossible, with God all things are possible? Is God powerful enough to let me be the starting point guard of the New York, uh, of the Golden State Warriors? Well, that may not be the best question. The better question is, why would he? <laughs> He's already got a man in place. Steph Curry from Charlotte, good guy, Christian. Why would he do that? Now, we'll flip the coin. I, I've been praying this prayer, and it will take about as much of the miraculous as that prayer would take. Dear God, I have written a production called Aren't You Somebody based on Dr. Mark Rutland's House of Grace in Chiang Rai, Thailand. And Lord, it, it, it's a preemptive work of sex trafficking, and I want to put this production, I've hired a filmmaker, and I want to put it on screens all around the country and the world. I want to raise thousands upon thousands, maybe millions of dollars for missions. And I want it to be a fine arts development tool and a soul winning tool. We've won 799 people in the Ebenezer experience in 35 cities and 12 states and 31,875 people. I want this to be more expansive than that, God. But I need a miracle. I need, I need financial resources and favor and cast and all, crew and all of that. And I don't know how to do it. That takes as much as a miraculous as the other. But can you sense the difference in the flavor of the two prayers? And by the way, we wrote nine letters and sent them out. And before the first one hit, people said, I've been praying and I just I heard about your production. And they've already sent in the first 4,500 that secures that filmmaker. God answers prayer. We just got to make sure we should want it. The third thing I wanted to say is uh, you need to be ready to tell him what you want. Be ready. 
The opportunity of a lifetime is confined within the lifetime of the opportunity. Are you ready to tell him what you want? Lord, Son of David, have mercy on us. Shut your mouth. That's Jesus. I'm sorry. Lord, Son of David. What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Uh, first of all, thanks for stopping. It's pretty awesome. Also, you smell good. You smell like the earth. Uh... I would like a grilled cheese sandwich, and my buddy wants a Labrador Retriever. That's he's always wanted a dog. They didn't fumble for the words. Jesus didn't have even an opportunity to put a dot at the end of the question mark. What do you want me to do for you? We want our side. They were ready. Are you? Or are you like some of the people I preach to? Good Lord knows my address. He wants to bless me. He knows where to find me. My faith is a source of my joy. Good luck on that, Turbo. Do you think the omniscient God of this blue planet knew those boys were blind? I mean, even you don't have to be Jesus. To, can, you can tell somebody who's blind. Why did he ask them? Do you know if you figure it out, send me an email. I don't know. Somehow he wanted us, wanted them to articulate their need. What do you want me to do for you? He knew they're blind. Because when we pray like that, I've never said this, when we pray like that, when we pray, I want to see even our prayer is a demonstration of our faith. We believe that you're powerful enough to give us our sight. You ready? When I was at the varsity one time, driving through, stop. I had my family with me. It's a long line. You've been there. You know what I'm talking about. A guy walks up to the counter. And she says, uh, the, the lady says, what do you have, what do you have, what do you have, what do you have? And the guy was a Yankee, and if that offends you, send me an email at joewilliams.com, make it nasty, make it ugly. <laughs> he said, ah, you know, I've never been here before. I don't know what you got. Tell me what's good around here. And the woman said, and I quote, shut your mouth and get to the back of the line. <laughs> and the dude did it. I mean, it's just that good of food. It's greasy. The next guy up was my 13-year-old son, Joseph, who's now 30. What do you have, what do you have, what do you have, son? I want a naked dog, I want a slaw dog, I want some onion rings, I want an orange frosty and Coca-Cola. And the woman said, and I quote, Hey, Boston, that's how you do it! I've never been prouder. <laughs> Be ready to tell him what you want when he asks, when the water is stirring when there's a move of God, when you're in your closet and you're praying about something else and all of a sudden the Holy Spirit hits you and says, you know, there's an anointing right now for other things and you just be ready to tell him, well, you know, I just want my whole family to be born again. I want all of my grandbabies to be born again. I want my son to get off of drugs. Be ready in those moments. Lord, I don't want there to be a black cloud of heaviness in my home. I want the atmosphere to be charged with the joy of Jesus. Just be ready to tell him what you want. Finally, this. Don't be afraid to ask him. Don't be afraid to ask. Look at James' scripture. James chapter 4. It's a pretty famous scripture. You want something, you don't get it. You kill your covet, you cannot have what you don't. What you want, you quarrel and you fight. But you don't have because you don't ask God. Do any of you want to fail the ASK test, the ask test when you get to heaven? Do you want to go up to Jesus and say, Jesus, this place has been beautiful. The first 100,000 years has just been incredible. It's like just, a, just unbelievable. You know, I always had a question I wanted to ask, and I'm glad, I, I'm glad I can ask you right this moment. I probably could have asked you before. But you know, when I was on the earth walking around, I was struggling with such and such. And, you know, it's water off a duck's back. It doesn't really bother me anymore. But I was just wondering why you never let me uh, find an, a deliverance over that. And the Lord turns and says to you or me, you never asked me. I'm not flunking that test. I, I'm not like the kid in the nursery. I, I do it. I tie my shoe, my 
myself. And after an hour, I says, could you do it? Could you do it? Help me, help me. I wake up in the morning and say, could you do it? Could you help me? I'm going to ask him for everything. How bizarre is it to pray a prayer like this? Dear God, thank you for forgiving me for all my sins, anger, malice, wrath, discord, strife, enmity, prejudice, pride, sexual immorality, lust of the flesh, pride of life, lovelessness, prayerlessness, hatefulness, all the junk you forgive. And somebody in the prayer meeting says, hey, ask him to help you with your rent. Pump the brakes, buddy. Are you kidding me? Let's not get mystical out here. I mean, if God can forgive us of our sins and write our name in heaven and we walk on streets of gold, maybe he can help with the electric bill. It's just a thought. <laughs> Romans 8.32 says, He that did not spare his only son but get, freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Ask of me and I'll give you the nation psalm too. What do you want as a church? What do you want as a ministry? What do you want as a business? What do you want in your family? In conclusion, there's a strange scripture from John chapter 1, if you'll put that up there. And you've been great in the booth up there. Thank you. Turning around, Jesus saw them following and said, What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? What do you have? And they said, Rabbi, which means teacher. Where are you staying? <laughs> wait, a, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, time out. God asks you what you want, and the only thing you can muster is, are y'all staying over at the Best Western, over at the Holiday Inn? I was just wondering. That's your best answer? The previous play is under further review. <laughs> Having reviewed the play, I can tell you, actually, that's brilliant. What do you have? What do you want? We want to know where you're staying. Because if we can just hang out where you're at, we'll have all our needs met forevermore. It's like that treasure buried in a field. It gets kicked up. And the guy buries it back and says, I'm selling out. I'm buying that. Because if I can get that, that's where the treasure is. Where are you staying? Where are you? So, so if the Lord says, Joe Phillips, what do you want me to do for you? It may not be. Let's start with phase one. May not be, it may not be that. It might just be. Throw that over here and say, I want you. Something lost in translation. So, so this morning, Parkway, Hear me, let there be no miscommunication. Ask and you will receive. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Let there be no miscommunication. He that didn't spare his only son but freely gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him freely give us all things? Do you believe that?